Good evening. This is the November regular meeting of the Cape Elizabeth School Board. We actually convened at 7 o'clock and had an executive session to discuss collective bargaining. We're now going to continue our meeting with the superintendent's report and the regular agenda. Before we do that, however, I am going to remove from the agenda item F under the superintendent's report, which is the negotiating committee report to the school board, and item 8 under the regular agenda, which is the consideration of the policy on equal educational opportunity for all students. That policy will be considered during the December meeting at the request of Mr. Haywood. And I'm going to add, in, to replace that, a consideration of a request by the superintendent to hire an English teacher and a physical education teacher. Now, Mr. Superintendent, your report. Okay, first, uh, I would ask, uh, do we have the high school representatives here this evening? I'd like to start um, our report off first with saying that our, that our uh, senior lounge has got off to a good start. They've uh, already cleaned it and painted it. And now they're looking, they're in the process of uh, looking for furniture. And the one acts, which were last Thursday and Friday, the, in case you don't know, those are brief plays that each class, the seniors, sophomores, and so on, put on in front of judges. And they um, are judged to see, you know, who has the better play. And, and um, the seniors won, the freshmen came in second, and the sophomores came in third, and the juniors came in last, which doesn't say much, but, and okay. you can. La last week, I think we had two state championship teams, the soccer and cross country, and they both won, anyway. And the new sports seasons have just begun with swimming, basketball, and indoor track. And we, last week in our meeting for the SAC, we decided to have a day of dialogue on AIDS awareness. And I think it has been decided that it's going to be broken up into a couple sessions over a week, is it? Yeah, it's We're still working on yeah, what, it's, yeah. what the structure is going to be on that. But we've come up with some good doctors to come and speak and everything. And also, the, our last thing is that the talent show, the annual senior talent show, will be held next Wednesday and Thursday, I believe. Tuesday and Wednesday. Tuesday and Wednesday? Tuesday and Thursday. Wednesday. Oh, I'm sorry. Thursday is Thanksgiving. Oh, okay. I guess it'll be Tuesday and Wednesday then. Yep. And that's just about it. Thank All you. right. Thank you very much. Good job. Uh, any questions? Could you please um, explain the name of the board right to our cross country and our soccer team, the coaches and the teams, congratulating them for us. I understand they were fantastic meets and games. And also, I heard I was not able to attend, but I heard excellent things about the one half length. Congratulations to the high school. Yeah, absolutely. On the one act, I think it was probably the best year I've ever seen, and that's saying a lot because I try to go every year and I always enjoy it thoroughly. So they did a good job. The next report uh, will be on the Quest program by the middle school principal. This is a new program initiated this year, and we have to thank the Lions for uh, helping us implement this. Yes, we do. Um, you may recall back in the spring during the budget season, we were discussing Quest as one of the programs we'd like to offer at the middle school. And with the help of Priscilla Hare, uh, Peter Rummery from the Lions organization, and two of our counselors, both Lyle Kramer and Joycelyn Green, they traveled to Peabody, Massachusetts, listened to a presentation by Quest International, which is the sponsoring organization for the development of what we call Skills for Adolescents. Skills for Adolescents is the program that is specifically uh, targeting our 6th, 7th, and 8th grade students at the middle school in a program that hopefully will teach them some decision-making skills, basically coping skills, to deal with um, negative peer pressure, to deal with uh, substance abuse, alcohol, drugs, to deal with family relationships, communication, and also to develop a way in which they can begin to assess themselves in terms of goal statements. We, uh, through the help of both the budget and the Lions organization, which donated $4,700, we were able to train 15 faculty this past summer. We did that with uh, members from the Gorham School System, from Scarborough, from Lake Region, and there was one other school system included uh, in the group of people that were trained this summer over in South Portland. We then 
rallied around the, um, that training program, which went on for two and a half days, and became very committed to the notion of a Skills for Adolescents program in the middle school. We have had several meetings since then, early in September, another one in October, to determine how we would actually implement the program. And uh, we had to await the, pr the actual arrival of materials, which I am pleased to say just arrived this past week. Actually, they arrived on Friday. So as a result of their arriving, the work of the staff and beginning to organize and implement the actual strategies and getting that program started, we will be able to, beginning either the week prior to Thanksgiving, actually the Thanksgiving week or the week after Thanksgiving, we have yet to meet to decide when we will begin the program. Um, we will offer the program for all sixth, seventh, and eighth grade students. This will be done by the 15 people who were trained. Not all of the classroom teachers were trained, in fact, with the program, but people such as uh, myself, Lyle, Julie Salikas, uh, Joycelyn Green, and several other people who just do not have what we would call a homeroom class will be assigned to the individual classes to make sure that we cover all students in those three grades. We expect that there will be about 45 sessions per grade and uh, we will phase in an implementation program whereby the eighth grade students will get the benefit of the heart of the program for this first year. For them it will terminate. I will say though that the Quest program is trying to develop a ninth grade program. But for the eighth grade they will have 45 sessions and the seventh grade will also have 45 sessions this year but with a two year approach to implementation we will have the seventh grade have it this year and also as eighth grade students next year. And for our sixth grade, we begin the heart of the program this year and they will receive the benefit of that program for the next two years. So we are looking at eventually phasing in a three-year Skills for Adolescents program in the middle school. The hope will be that we will get all of our sixth, seventh, and eighth grade uh, teachers, uh, those teachers who teach those particular grades trained so that we can have a uh, staff that is quite aware of the program and how it is taught, what value it has for both themselves and also for the students. I would like to say that in, uh, in respect of Cape Elizabeth, we are approaching the program instruction much differently than other school systems have. The option is to have someone like a health educator teach the students. I felt that um, that was certainly one approach to teaching the program but I wanted to see more of our teachers involved with the students in this particular program because I think it has value to both faculty and students alike. So we went ahead with the idea of training 15 of our faculty in the middle school. There was an additional strand that uh, I would like you to be aware of and, and uh, parents, there was a four part parent seminar. Each seminar lasts about two hours and the seminars are somewhat in sync with the program content that's taught students and basically is a way of parents connecting with the program, understanding what it is that students are, are being taught in school and how they themselves at home can be supportive of the program. There's also a homework component where students can, should they wish and they'll be encouraged to do so, to come home and basically help to get the parents involved in what they're doing at school. So I am, uh, we are all committed to the program and think that it will offer something in addition to uh, the typical academic load that we give our students in the grades six, seven, and eight. And hope that by virtue of the program, our students will begin to take a closer look at themselves, the relationship they have to one another, and how they go about making decisions that will make their lives more productive and keep them away from some of the issues that they are presently, that we as adults are presently concerned with their involvement. So. That's Quest, and I'd be more than happy to answer any questions you have. Um, spend quite a time getting this going, and we're excited about starting it up. Yes? I have a, one question. Is how long, you said 45 sessions per grade. How long is each session? We're, a session is 42 minutes, and we're looking at spreading that out over about 23, 24 weeks. And for the 7th and 8th grade students, we're going to have to rotate through the, through the program of studies to make sure that uh, the students get the benefit of this program. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by rotate through? Well, Does that mean one day if, it's during math period and another yes, day it's yeah. We felt it was the, it's the only, because we have such a hard load of courses for students, we felt the only way that we could do that is to pull them out of the academics and we're doing it on a rotating basis so that no one particular subject is sacrificed at the hands of another. 
Yes, I have another question. Mm -hmm. I think that there would be some parents who feel that their children have a very fine sense of self-esteem and who take it as their responsibility to deal with these issues at home. Do we mm -hmm. have a method by which somebody could, a parent could say that their child needs history instruction far more than self-esteem instruction or needs grammar instruction far more than this and that they can choose an academic choice for their child as opposed to uh, this self-esteem building program? At the present time, the answer to that is no. The implementation is, is a full implementation program for all students. If there were parents who objected for any reason to the content of the program, that they certainly may come in and speak to the administration, and I'm sure with, uh, with good reason they could be excused from the program. But the program is meant to be absolutely non-judgmental, deals in no values clarification. It is an open-ended discussion with students to get them to talk about issues. Uh, teachers follow through the program. It's, uh, it's very cut and dry in terms of everything is laid out in very neat order. Teachers just implement the program as it exists. And we did have a chance over the two and a half days to see that program to see what value it has. I have no questions of the content, so I feel um, quite I confident. Don't, I, don't, I don't mean mm -hmm. if somebody objects to the content. It's a whole another issue. But as, no, as the a answer parent is no. who feels that their child needs instruction in a given area mm -hmm. in preference to this type of instruction, I think it's something we should look into because I think there would be parents who um, may prefer that their child have opportunity to study an area that they feel is more worthwhile for their child. Well, I think I hear Mr. Palmer saying that he will talk to parents on a case-by-case -case mm -hmm. basis, and I think that's what you want mm -hmm. to have. I think also, Fran, when we took on this quest and voted it in budget ourselves, mm -hmm. that we felt we had had a real push from the community as far as saying in this community from the study that the university did that there is a real drug alcohol problem and we need to get hold of it and we need to start <coughs> much younger than at the high school mm -hmm. level. We needed to start down low, sixth, fifth, fourth, somewhere, and this was an ideal program that we all did vote in budget because mm -hmm. we felt this was a mandate from the community as a whole for us to take care of, yeah. to not take care of, to try to get some handle on. Mm -hmm. And I also had a question about that. Please, Priscilla. No, just a comment. Uh, after going to the introductory program, I came away with the impression that the schools that trained as many staff as possible <coughs> did a far better job with it because then everybody's expectations were the same of the children, whether they moved from gym class to art class to back to their home room. And it was a far better way of going about it if you could do it that way. That's so I was really, I'm really glad that that's the way we're going about it. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? We will be looking for parents to attend uh, one of the training sessions that Quest will be offering in hopes that they can become our parent seminar leaders. Right now, Joycelyn Green and I will be leading the parent seminars with the assistance of a couple parents out there in the, uh, in the audience. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next, uh, Madam Chairman, I'd like to make just a few comments on the 14th Annual Fall Conference of Superintendents. The uh, high priority items this year appear to be the innovative programs for gifted students, which is something we have to be in compliance with. And I'm very pleased to say that the committee is working diligently and will present to the Administrative Council a curricular model uh, probably next week. And I'm hopeful that we can bring the entire model to the board in December and then send it to the state for a five-year plan. The uh, subject of AIDS, of course, was naturally discussed and a host of clinics were held just about everywhere. Certification for teachers has been returned to the local authorities. It will probably be a program uh, that will uh, consume uh, the time of some 31 teachers per year in this system for the next three years. I hope to uh, the regulations are now out, and I hope to bring something to the board prior to budget time or during budget time. Uh, one of the things that I was able to do is spend uh, some time with a group from Kennebunk who've been running an elementary school similar to our model and have been doing this for a number of years, and that was very beneficial.
So all in all, it was a worthwhile program. Yeah, well, you left out uh, one item that was in your written report. That I, 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 I hope it wasn't because of your priorities. Well, the state priority to raise students' aspirational level. <laughs> yeah. Well, you see, I think we're going to handle that at the December meeting when we report on the SAT testing and the college placement. And I, I don't want to give this away, but the principal has finished an excellent report on college placement. And you're going to be able to trace um, how uh, six years ago, 70% of the young people of this community went to college. And last year, 93% went. And I hope to be able to, we hope to be able to tell you what's happened during those years. So Good, can I say, that report's going to be made when? December. In December, could I just tell uh, you and the principal, before you make your report, one of the things I will say next December, this coming December, when you make your report, is that it's wonderful that 93% go to college now and 70 some percent, only 70 percent, went some years ago. But I don't think that gets to the real meat of what we're talking about in terms of raising students' aspirations and level of achievement, all students. Uh, but you're saying that to basis of those having read the report. No, I know, I know, but I just want to, to, to tell you that that's still one of the things that I'm going to raise because uh, I also have read recently that because a lot of colleges can't get enough students, they're in financial trouble, that uh, more colleges are becoming non-selective. That is, sea lightning and chew mashed potato. So the, it's great that we're motivating a lot of kids to go to college, but what's even more important is to motivate them to move toward more challenging uh, educational confrontations. And that's what I hope We'll discuss. Well, I, I'm hopeful that uh, we can become involved in more educational confrontation. <laughs> <laughs> That's a nice phrase. I like that very much. Uh, I won't. Uh, I won't pursue that with the superintendent at this time. <laughs> I'm sure he'll hear about it again. I'm sure he will. <laughs> Uh, I'd like the, uh, to announce the, uh, the teacher resignation. Uh, this is Linda Friedman, the half-time kindergarten teacher. Her presently uh, looking for a replacement. I think we usually vote to accept resignation. Like a motion? I so move. And second? Second. All in favor? Five to nothing. Uh, now I'd like a report on the high school standards committee uh, by the chairman, the vice principal of the high school. At the uh the conclusion of school last June, Dr. Refn and I invited um, concerned faculty uh, to meet with us in sort of a roundtable discussion to discuss management issues at the high school. From that group, or from that meeting, uh, we developed or put together a policy review committee, which on your, the, the sheet that you should have, uh, was comprised of seven teachers, two parents, there were four students, and Dr. Refn and I. Um, from that, we met three times over the summer, primarily in July. And the major concerns of that group uh, concerned, the, uh, first of all, the amount of class cutting that was going on in the high school, student freeze, or the status of uh, juniors and seniors having free periods during the school day, uh, detention policies, the handling of student misbehavior in classrooms, and uh, planned student absences due to illness or vacations, extended vacations. From that, um, new policies uh, came into effect that are have been implemented this year from these concerns. Uh, as far as the class cutting, 
uh, we have gone where students uh, were allowed to uh, cut a class two times before they lost credit. Uh, and that every quarter that would change. So in other words, a student would have, um, could cut a class two times uh, every quarter of, the of, of school and no, no credit was lost, okay? This year we said we changed that policy from that committee to that on the second cut for the length of that, that class, be it a semester course or a year course, credit would be lost. And we, we decided on 2.5 credits or one quarter's worth of, of, a, of an academic subject's credits. Um, as far as student free periods, uh, we put more emphasis into effort grades as far as those students who have uh, a grade less than honors, C's or D's, that we were re really looking at students to uh, really strive to do better in their classes and that students who may not have the capability of getting uh, an A or, or B in a class could still uh, earn the right to, to have a free period as a junior or a senior uh, by showing that their classroom teachers that their effort was above, above average. Uh, as far as detention policies, we uh, tighten those policies quite a bit as far as uh, including both what we call general detentions, which are detentions that come from the uh, main office, be it for unexcused latenesses, students in the halls when they shouldn't be, and also uh, paralleling that with, with teacher detentions for class cutting, for homework that isn't complete, or things of that nature. Um, we also, uh, as far as handling students' misbehavior in classrooms, we now have a policy in which if a student is asked to leave a classroom, he reports to Dr. Efron's office. I check in there. Uh, every period during the day and then uh, there's a checklist that I go through with that teacher. I follow up every day with the teacher. If a student is removed from a class, I go back to that teacher. Why was so-and-so removed from your class? What action should we take? Every time a student is removed from a class, that teacher is asked to call a parent so that the parents are aware that their son or daughter was asked to leave a classroom. Um, and also for planned student absences, we now have a form that we, when a student is going to be out for an extended time, uh, we have asked that they come to the main office and fill out a sheet. Each of those sheets goes to the, the class, uh, that student's teachers. And, and the teacher would make a remark whether it's a wise idea that this person should miss class or, and also list assignments that that person uh, will be required to make up when, when he or she is gone. Um, you have in front of you the sheet of some of the statistics that, or the data that I've collected uh, in comparing in, as far as the class cutting from 85, 86 to the current. Um, also the detention policies, uh, the numbers of students. We were able to, as for, let's go back to the class cutting. Um, two years ago, or three years ago I should say, there were 297 class cuts, okay? Last year when we put in a Saturday detention policy to try to curtail this cutting, um, it was cut to 210 uh, cuts for the quarter. This past year, there were 46 cuts uh, at the end of the first quarter. I also wanted to make note that uh, 25 of those cuts were uh, accumulated by three students. One student who was no longer in the school uh, uh, had cut 15 of those classes. So over the remainder of the student body, 21 cuts over, uh, and it included 16 students for 21 cuts out of our 525, 526 student population. So I think it's, 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 it's a strive in the right direction. We still got to have a ways to go as far as trying to cut down or totally wipe out class cutting, but I, I think it's been a significant, it's had a significant impact on our, on our policy change. And I know we met uh, at the uh, mid-quarter, about four weeks into the quarter, the, the uh, group met, the policy review committee, in fact, Dr. Pelletier joined us for that meeting and we reviewed it at that point, the status, and uh, the committee was very pleased with the efforts at that point, or the impact, I should say, and we will be meeting within another week and a half to show the, the uh, end of the quarter statistics as far as uh, class cutting, detentions, Saturday detentions and, and suspensions for the school year. So, any questions? Carol. Uh, you, know, you, you, you mentioned that you hope to eliminate it and uh, I would like to see some expression of uh, sentiment on the part of the board that it is our objective that class cutting be eliminated at Cape Elizabeth High School. That it, that it not exist at some point, and that I would hope that that would be our objective. I Is agree it? with you that, that we don't mm -hmm. want class cutting. I think that's what this office mm -hmm. is all about, and I think that's what they've been striving for with the rule changes 
to, to totally eliminate it, not control it, but simply eliminate it. I, I think it's important to make that distinction. I think that what happens in uh, the dynamics of uh, running an organization like this and being on the school board, it's very difficult to have much impact. I think that this is an area where we can have some impact. I think if the school board speaks clearly, and the administration, I think, would like to hear the school board speak clearly on this issue, that it is our objective to eliminate cuts, hardly an objective that can be criticized. And uh, that, uh, and I think, even as I've heard you speak in the past about this, Rick, these are the kinds of things you'd like to hear mm -hmm. from us. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So I, for one, would say that it is my objective, and I hope it's the objective of the others, to eliminate yeah, I agree with you. There should be no cutting. I, I think um, one thing I noticed in reading the first copy of the Cape Insight this year, that there were about three articles within two pages about the terrible new rules, and mm -hmm. that said to me we at least had somebody's attention. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know about the student's attitude, but I think that was... And, and the impact it's had in the classroom as far as the feedback from teachers has been tremendously positive, obviously, about this. Uh, uh, and it's also allowed me to, to pursue the other issues of the school rather than chasing down students in a class who are, who are cutting class and be able to uh, deal with, say, detentions, uh, uh, dealing with 100% of the students, of the 128 students who were given detentions, I was able to follow up on all of those because my time allowed me to do that as opposed to uh, chasing down students who may have cut classes uh, too much. But. It hasn't yet been said. I think I speak for every member of the school board in applauding the progress you've made thus far. That's Thank a you. tremendous uh, decrease in cutting, even from last quarter, the first quarter of last year, to 212 cuts as opposed to 46 cuts this this quarter. I think that's a tremendous improvement, and I, along with everybody else, look for it to continue to improve. Thank you. Thank you, Fran. On the record, uh, on the school suspensions, are those mostly in-house? Suspensions yes. That? Yeah, I would say about 50-50, Priscilla. It depends on, on that day. If, uh, we, when we hold an in-school suspension, it's held in the conference room adjacent to my office. And if there's a meeting scheduled for that day, if, you know, if there's a committee meeting there, then what I do is contact the parent. If the parent is at home, then I, I allow that parent to say, okay, I have the custody of my child at home. If the student is home alone, then we definitely have it in school. Um, and that's something that the parent and I uh, discuss over the phone as far as uh, how that suspension should best be served. Uh, but I would say about half, of, roughly half of them were in-house in and, and then the other half were at home. Again, may I say the same as Fran, that the reduction is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. really Thank startling. you for all the work. Yeah. Thank you. I think we're all happy to see this improvement. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd all like at this time to call on the high school principal to uh, make a very short report. <clears throat> Thank you. All my reports are short, you know that. <laughs> I'd like to go back to um, athletics just, just for a moment. This has been a remarkable fall season for the high school. The, the two state championship teams are, are certainly the most newsworthy, but every single one of our teams this fall had outstanding uh, seasons, each one of them. Uh, and uh, I congratulate all the athletes. Uh, I'll remind you, you know, this fall, we had the highest number of students go out for fall athletics than, than ever before. Um, that includes freshman teams, uh, junior varsity teams, as well as the varsity teams, which, which in each sport did so well. So I commend uh, the athletes, I commend all the coaches, uh, the parents who've uh, in a number of instances just started uh, uh, booster squads and have been tremendous supports for each of the teams. Uh, some of the sports <laughs> programs have begun to send varsity athletes down on the weekend to work with the uh, elementary and middle school leagues. And having those 
high school kids come down and help ref and coach on the weekends has been a, another wonderful addition that's happened uh, this fall for, for some of these programs. So I'd say um, the whole program is strong right through and that's why we have a couple of championship teams. That's not an anomaly. And I congratulate everybody who's involved. Also, number two, we had our business and professions uh, career fair on October 28th. And I would like to publicly thank the people who came down and worked with our students that day. We had 10 different uh, uh, people come down representing 10 different professions, a total of 214 students signed up and went to at least two of these uh, 10 sessions on that day. So by way of uh, thanks to the people who helped out, uh, Paul Aronson, uh, district attorney who represented law, John Downing from H.M. Payson who, rep who represented stock brokering, which has certainly been an exciting field lately, Janet Efron, a clinical social worker, represented counseling. Special thanks to her. <laughs> uh, Richard Gosselin, a CPA, a principal accountant of Barry Dunn, McNeil and Parker, who talked about tax law and accounting. Uh, Dick Rodden, who's president of General Properties, who talked about entrepreneurship. John Holt from Body and Company, who talked about advertising. Uh, John McDonald from the U.S. Secret Service, who talked about law enforcement. Jim Orr, who is president of uh, Union Mutual, who talked about what it's like to be a CEO, a chief executive officer. Uh, Dick Rawlings from Northwestern Mutual Life, who talked about sales. And Dr. Philip Landry, uh, anesthesiologist, who talked about medicine. Uh, also, Jim Orr. Uh, president of uh, Union Mutual spoke to our senior seminar class and also to the economics class. So I especially would like to thank these 10 people for their help that day. It was a good day. I'd like to also tell you about uh, some of what's been going on in social studies because it's been involved also with a number of professionals and trips. Um, firstly, uh, as you may know, we had an election at the high school. It went very well. But prior to that uh, election on Tuesday, November 3rd, um, with the help of uh, Henry Adams and Deborah Pizzo, we ran a mock election, election for all the high school students, uh, Friday, October 30th. Uh, the senior seminar students uh, uh, took care of the electioneering, took care of the uh, signing kids in, the whole voting operation on that Friday. Uh, the senior seminar students formed two debate teams and each of, the, each of these debate teams went to five or six different social studies classes where they debated both sides of two issues. One team divided the two sides of the main Yankee question and the other team uh, debated the two sides of the, uh, of the gun amendment. That was done in the week prior to the mock election and augmented the work that the social studies teachers did naturally that week in trying to teach the students about everything that was on that ballot. So the students, I think, when they did that mock election, uh, went in reasonably prepared as to what was on the ballot. Um, I think uh, both the mock election and the actual election went very smoothly. I'm really very pleased. I think we've taken nice advantage of having the elections at the high school. And, uh, and I said we we're going to really do up the uh, presidential elections next year. Uh, some recent uh, activities that have gone on. Uh, as you may know, the Modern World class has regular speakers that come in and present to, to those civics classes. Mary Webster uh, <coughs> spoke to uh, civics classes last week and is coming back again this week. Michael McGovern is going to be in uh, civics classes this week. Uh, field trips, uh, Randy is presently organizing the 
field trips for the civics courses uh, to both state and federal courts, and that'll be coming up starting in about two weeks. There are a couple of other special programs I'd like to tell you about. Um, Cape Elizabeth, Cape Elizabeth High School will have several students, it looks like we'll have four students, involved in the planning of Martin Luther King Day celebrations this year. They'll be working with a committee representing a number of different organizations and schools in the greater Portland area. Also, several American history students, I think five in number, will be, in a, will be in a, involved in a project to reenact the Massachusetts State Convention to ratify the U.S. Constitution. Students from Maine and Massachusetts are going to meet in Boston on February 5th and 6th. That's the culminating event of, of this state ratification program. Uh, and a lot of the events leading up to that involve role, researching and role-playing the individual delegates who actually attended the, that, uh, that constitutional uh, convention 200 years ago. Some of those events are as follows. On Monday, November 16th, there'll be a press conference in Portland. Information about this project will be shared. Students and faculty involved will meet at the main historical building. Uh, that happened today. Randy went with uh, four students. On Friday, December 11th, all-day workshop at Colby College, presentations and research on the Federalist versus Anti-Federalist positions. Uh, again, the students and Randy will be going. Uh, the program uh, on January 23rd, the program will be in Portland, uh, which will focus around the Jefferson debates. Evening guest speakers will uh, include both senators from Maine, and that program will last all day. And then this will come and culminate February 5th and 6th with the reenactment of the actual Constitution Convention. Uh, the Cape Elizabeth delegation will be role-playing the role of Joshua Dyer, who was a representative to that uh, Constitutional Convention and was a Cape Elizabeth resident. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, I, uh, Madam Chairman, only have uh, two other. First, I'd like to make a statement uh, relative uh, to the bomb uh, that uh, exploded in the high school on election day. And I would compliment the principal and the assistant principal and the, uh, the police chief for the manner in which they've handled it. Uh, I've had a few calls relative to this, and I'd like people to know that <coughs> The town manager and the superintendent will meet with the principals next week, the fire chief and the police chief, to review first our bomb scare policy and a bomb blast goal. So rest assured uh, that we are in front of this. The young person is no longer with us. The superintendent's hearing was held today. And uh, any such action, we will keep you fully informed. The next statement I'd like to make is uh, I've asked the uh, town manager if it uh, would be convenient for the council to meet for a dinner meeting with the board to meet with NESDIC uh, personnel who are doing our study. And the date that we tended to selected was July, January 19th for uh, a dinner, uh, you know, our kind of dinner. <laughs> <laughs> upstairs, say maybe 6.30. Would that be convenient for the board, the 19th, tentatively? <laughs> That's fine. I also might add uh, that uh, board members who are leaving the board are certainly invited and certainly we'd appreciate their input. <laughs> Put it down for a good yeah. number of yeah. Lasagna again. Oh, lasagna, well. Yeah. Didn't want to miss it. All right. All right. Then I, Madam Chairman Person, uh, I would hope you would take just a moment so that uh, we may make a couple of presentations.
first one is presented to Helena Redmond by members of the Administrative Council of the Cape Elizabeth School Department for her dedicated service as a member of the Cape Elizabeth School Board, 81 to 87. I'd like to present this to you. We have a student photographer now on salary. This is a very big one, and I hope she's here. I saw her. She's gone long ago. Oh, I'll let you have to just settle for television. Thank you very much. Someone mentioned to me that uh, six years is a long time, and I don't think I had any gray hair then. <laughs> the next presentation is to Sharon Miller by members of the Administrative Council of the Cape Elizabeth School Department for her dedicated service as a member of the Cape Elizabeth School Board, 81 to 87. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed my six years. It's been a real education for me, and I think it's the most enjoyable volunteer job I've ever had. And I've, I've really enjoyed the people I've worked with, not only the administrators, the teachers, the board members, but everyone in the community who supports the school. Thank you. On our regular agenda, our first item is the approval of the minutes of the regular meeting. Are there any? Additions, corrections. And the minutes are approved and submitted. Now we have tonight for the first time. Last month he was new on the job, and tonight he's been here a month, and uh, Mr. LaBelle is going to give us his business manager's report. Thank you. On page 17 of your agenda, you have the anticipated revenues <coughs> and the year-to-date revenues for the general program. Uh, to date, we have received 34% of the revenues, which, you know, out of the four months, we're pretty much online. Uh, down the bottom, you have your special program, which is your Chapter 1, Chapter 2, local entitlements and that. Uh, to date on those, we received 13%, but these federal programs usually start coming in later in the year as far as the revenues. On page 18, you have the anticipated budget ex 
expenditures for 87, 88, along with the actual expenditures for uh, up to October 31st. Uh, to date, we have expended 29% of the budget. This will be inflated somewhat once negotiations have been settled and the retroactive phase will go into effect. Any questions on the general program? Today, you know, we don't see any problem areas right now, but we are keeping a close <coughs> look at the budget. You know, there's still some variables out there. Winter hasn't set in yet. Not, not, for me, not for me. Tell us. Page, page 19 of your agenda, you have the uh, enrollment figures for the month of November 1st, total 1543 compared to last month of 1539, we're up four. Uh, you should note that the funding from the state uh, they usually take the October 1st enrollments along with the April 1st enrollments of the current fiscal year and take the average of those, and that's what your base for enrollments for the year. So it isn't this month's report, it's last That's right. It's report. October's, which was so we don't get credit for 1,539. That's correct. Well, if they stay on, you get half of that because the yeah. half is better than nothing. That's right. That's right. It seems to me that Mr. Palmer, you should report to your <laughs> Bring him in October first. <laughs> For the uh, community services report on page twenty, that too today is in very well good shape. So far, we've collected one hundred fifty-one thousand uh, dollars. They have spent one hundred twenty-five. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any problems in that account. And also on page 21 under food services, uh, I have made some changes to this reporting. We're strictly going to report on the cash basis, which means that at the end of June, there will be some adjustments as far as the accrual basis. Just your receivables will take place in that. So far, you know, there, was still a, there still is $5,438.15 in the cash account. However, this is down due to that there are some receivables that are not in yet from the state. That's all I have. Do you have any questions? Okay. Questions, anybody? Thanks very much. Thank you. It looks like we're in good shape. So far. Everybody's always happy when we're in good shape. Let's see. Our next item is the consideration of requests for sabbatical leave during the 1988-89 school year. And I believe Mr. Haywood is going to give us a report. Uh, actually, a very short report. Both Dr. Efron and Ms. Hutton uh, presented to the sabbatical committee their uh, possible plans or their hoped to be implemented plans for a sabbatical study. And the sabbatical committee uh, recommended that in each case the approval be granted for the persons to pursue individual study and very, you know, they presented their plans to us both obviously different, and we approved both of the plans for sabbatical. Um, I think all of us felt they were very intellectually stimulating uh, plans and would bring back to our school system uh, a lot of expertise that um, certainly would be beneficial for our students. So it's with pleasure, actually, that I report that. Okay, are there questions from board members on the I have to say that, that it's, it's always difficult when, when such excellent people want to take a year off because we'll miss them so much. And they both, Ms. Hutton and Dr. Effin, make such fine contributions to the school system that it's hard to think we could do without them for a year. Uh, particularly replacing a high school principal is, is a very hard thing to do for a year. Are, are there comments or questions before we? I, I, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know a whole lot about this other than I read Dr. Epkin's letter. Well, and we had a workshop with him. I, I don't believe I was there at this workshop. Oh, I'm sorry. i have forgotten about this. Uh, would it be in order for me to find out some more about this and what our policy would be with respect to administrators getting sabbatically? If you can do so briefly, I, I think um, I, I I felt we had had covered it all in the workshop, and I'd forgotten that you weren't there. 
Do you have a few quick questions? I don't know. I think it's kind of important. I, I, it, it is important. I think that uh, if we have, I, I think it's uh, significant that we have a sabbatical leave policy uh, where teachers are, uh, are permitted to leave for a year. Um, I'm not against that. I think, uh, I think there's some good that flows from it. I think you, it does cost the taxpayers some money to have that happen. It probably costs the students something to have that happen. You're never assured, uh, you have no assurance that it will be, uh, that the system would be rewarded because you're never assured that the person will uh, come back to you, how long they'll stay, and I know that that's happened in the past. Uh, nevertheless, I'm not categorically opposed such a program, but I do think it's a very significant step for this town to say that, that, that you know, teachers, there's more than one. Uh, administrators, we have uh, one principal in each school, three principals, and one superintendent. Now, I think that the board ought to at least uh, Consider the fact. I'm not against this, but I, mean, I think this is the kind, kind of thing that a supervising board ought to examine. Uh, if you extend the policy to one of the three principals, how can you not extend it to the superintendent, for instance? I mean, there are a whole lot of questions, and uh, uh, I do have concern. about doing this, because I think that, uh, uh, where do you get the principal? Well, I've said all I'm going to say, uh, obviously there won't be any discussion on this, but uh, we can move on in the agenda, but uh, I, I do have concerns about it. Uh, Madam Chairman, could I uh, react to... Uh, yes, you can, and I, I'm sure Fran has some comments. One, and I think I, I said this in the workshop. I think, uh, in all fairness, that uh, the uh, the perks uh, that uh, are given to teachers should be allowed for administrators. And I appreciate the, the, your question of degree. Uh, we probably have uh, 15 people in administrative positions against 129 full-time teachers. Policy calls for four teachers for sabbatical. We've been quite fortunate. Last year we had none, this year we had one. Uh, I don't know that it would be difficult to come up with the same ratio because we are so much smaller. But uh, by awarding one, uh, it doesn't seem to be out of line. Uh, any more than if you had a dental policy for teachers, you probably want it for uh, administrators. I called, uh, and I hate to use the name of this town again, but I called uh, Darianne today, and their superintendent is on sabbatical. And that's quite common. Uh, this superintendent is not requesting sabbatical, by the way. But uh, I think you'll find that where teachers have a sabbatical program, I would suspect in 99% of the cases, the administrators have a similar program. However, the numbers would be a lot smaller. Would you, would you then expect that uh, it is possible that each year uh, one administrator would be on sabbatical leave? No, not each year. I suspect that uh, uh, if you, I've only been here a short time. I think if you go back uh, for 10 years, how many administrators have requested sabbatical? Well, I'm not sure that uh, history uh, would be the fairest measure of what's going to happen in the future because I'm not sure the issue ever arose. It is arising now. I'm not necessarily against it, but I think that there, I, I think that there's some things that, that ought to be examined here, and I think that uh, <coughs> five years down the road, another school board uh, may be confronted with a problem. I mean, if history is a measure, uh, none. I don't believe that there's never been a, a problem. There's probably never been an administrator ever in the history of Cape Elizabeth on sabbatical leave. So, uh, 
see, the, uh, the saving grace is sabbatical, regardless if it's for administrators or teachers, is at the discretion of the board. I would find it very hard. I expect to be on the board a couple more years. I would find it very difficult to say to another administrator, including yourself, uh, no, it's at our discretion, Mr. Pelletier, no, you can't go. Uh, I think I think that Dr. Pelletier would be uh, on firm ground to say, well, wait a minute. Why am I different than the high school principal? You see, and I would feel that you could, it would be fair to look at the circumstances. For, for example, if, if a principal were heading up a building program or some very crucial program that it was required, I think it would be, the board could easily say to the superintendent, we feel this is a bad time for you to pursue uh, what you want to pursue. No, I, but I, I can't quarrel with, uh, with, with what you're saying uh, on the basis of its fairness uh, or reasonableness. I think there are two schools of thought here, Darrell, and, and uh, uh, frankly, uh, uh, I have uh, come to be a great admirer of the high school principal. And one of my uh, concerns years on the board, I can't get a handle on a couple of things that I'm interested in, one of which is something that we talked about earlier tonight, which is having a program for the rest of the students in these schools to help uplift them and to challenge them, and I think he's one of the real resources we have in this system to bring that about. He's an expert on curriculum. He, he is a person who I sense, rightly or wrongly, understands what I'm saying about these things. And uh, I, I worry about uh, losing that resource. I think he's very important to the system. And he's gonna be mad at me after this is all over for uh, raising these issues. And I don't do it to deprive him of, his, of, of a sabbatical. I think he's going to get a sabbatical, but I want to make my point. I'd like to make a couple of comments. Uh, first of all, really on a clerical issue, that the sabbatical leave um, portion of our contract, uh, and I, it does not, the contract does not apply to the principals and the administrators, but it clearly uh, signifies that there needs to be seven years of full-time service and capable in the school. So this is not something that, uh, you can, one can be eligible for after two or three years or five years. It's quite clearly stated, very clearly stated in here, seven years of full-time service. I think it was a very strong, strong feeling of the sabbatical committee that it would be a shame to have the only way that an administrator can um, improve his or her ability to administer a school or a school system have the only way that that can happen be for that person to basically quit their job, go to school someplace, and then most logically go elsewhere and sell their services, enhanced services, to another school system. We really felt that it was um, advantageous to us to have a principal, in this instance, uh, recognizing that there were some areas of uh, administration that he wants to know more about and be more effective in being able to implement change and implement improvement in the high school setting. And that we felt that uh, the plans for his education were very particularly focused toward improvement in that area uh, that he sees as beneficial to changing the program in exactly the direction that you see uh, as desirable. We really felt that it was to our advantage to take advantage to, for us to capitalize on this administrator's desire to uh, go out and make specific educational um, improvements and uh, administrative improvements in his own ability and come back to us and use those improvements here, not someplace else where he can go and have an increase.
increased uh, credential and, and sell that someplace else. We wanted him back, and we thought that this was a very good way to get him, to give him some uh, time to grow and to be further educated and then come back here and uh, help us out. And I, I think we very strongly felt that way. I, I certainly, after the workshop we had, and I, I think it's really unfortunate you miss it because we, we went through most of these issues together, and um, if I'd been smarter, I would have given you a call to fill you in on the things we talked about. But um, I came away with that same feeling, that it's, it's a compliment to us that, that our principal wants to improve himself and come back and continue with us. And I, I, I take it that way exactly, and I endorse his plan. Don't quarrel, I don't quarrel with anybody's good faith in it. There is, not surprisingly, another point of view. Also not often in bad faith. Yes, I know. In that workshop, we also questioned if we would have a different type of uh, policy with different rules as far as an administrator uh, leading a sabbatical goes. And I have not seen, I do not see in our packet or any place a separate type of rules or whether we need to discuss that at some point and whether we can have a motion tonight to say, yes, we grant this lead pending uh, agreement on rules, Procedure. procedures. Yeah. So I would like to separate out the two. I, I think it, it would be both. good tonight so that he can make his plans that we, we would approve them in spirit. And then if there were procedures to work out, so that that be done at a later date. Could I, could, could I ask whether the board members intend to hire a principal for a year? Yes. At least that was my understanding, yes. yes. Generally, in most cases, uh, they uh, they generally put an acting principal who knows he's there for a year or she, yeah. and uh, you know one that's able to hold the place together, and in many instances even improve the place. You know where you have a great deal of talent, and uh, you know naturally <coughs> then is a given thought to that. But I think it's sort of premature at this point. Oh yeah, I know. I'm just, I'm just exploring that because I think that's one of the considerations. Somebody's going to have to be in charge over there, and uh, uh, we do have an obligation. We do have a tool. We have obligations to the administrators and the teachers, and we also have obligations to the clients, okay. to the customers right. who go to school over there. Great. I move that we accept the answer.
vote on, on, on Fran's um, motion as it stands, are you comfortable that the details can be worked out? Or do you think the motion needs to be amended? I guess legally the motion needs to be amended. Um, granted, uh, I will move to amend the motion with the amendment being that if all parties are in agreement with new procedures for sabbatical leave, that that would be correct. <laughs> <laughs> what did you say? If all, if all the parties, or both parties, both really, parties, both parties are, are in agreement as to the details of, of a policy statement or the obligation. Yeah. I think that says what you wanted to say. Mm -hmm. So we need a second to the amended motion. No, second to the amendment. A second to the amendment. And then a second to the motion? I'm getting lost. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, you okay. Both the amendment and then both both the amendment. All right. Is there a second to the amendment? All right. Is there then a second to the motion? We need to vote. We to oh, we need to vote the amendment. Right. All in favor of the amendment? All opposed? I know. I'm not, I'm not opposed to the amendment. All right. Five to nothing on the amendment. All right. Now, now I need a second on the main motion. Oh, wait. Maybe I did. Who seconded? It was Fran's motion. <laughs> Sharon, Sharon seconded. Second. 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 All right. We have a second on the main motion. Uh, do you want more discussion before we vote? No. No. Um, all, right. all, 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 all I want to say is be before we vote, is I think very highly of the high school principal, and I think he knows that. And uh, you know, I've come a long way, and I'm a great admirer of his. Having said that, call for the vote. Uh, <laughs> all in favor. Like disclaimer. All opposed. Four to one. Four to one. All right. Not opposed to the. I want to make it clear. Not opposed to this high school principal. Opposed to this. Concept that we're getting into. I think we all hear you. Yeah. See, our next item is the consideration of the town council request to change their polling place from town hall to the high school gymnasium. And this is because um, the request for the November election came to us and we approved only the November date. I remember that was your motion and we now need to approve the high school as a polling place and you do have in your packet a, a report. From the town clerk. And I think it's safe to say that uh, it was a very successful day and uh, I think it's the feeling of all of us that uh, not only does this work nicely that it enhances our program, as you can see, with uh, voting machines and uh, the social studies uh, getting involved and uh, the parent group collecting money and selling coffee and just a host of things that uh, make the community what it is. So it would be my feeling that uh, you allow them to vote in the high school. Is there any questions from board members on this or comments? I thought it went very well, speaking for myself. I um, seemed that the disruption was minimal to the high school program. There were a few people that found out where the high school was that never knew before, and I think that's always healthy to know where the high school is in your town. Any other questions, comments? That is addressed in the town clerk's um, report. The town's responsibility, of course, is ironing out the details, and our responsibility is merely approving the use of the building. And they do mention um, 
a wheelchair being provided for the elderly or handicapped citizens who find the long walk an inconvenience and turning on outside lights on time to meet Eastern Standard Time. There were details like that, and of course the first time through there were bound to be problems, but that is something that is dealt with in this report, and you're welcome to read it if you'd like to. I move that we have the uh, polling place for the town at the high school. Is there a second? For all further elections. Mm -hmm. Second. Um, any discussion? All in favor? Aye to nothing. Um, item number six is the consideration of a policy with regards to the admission of non-resident students to high school. This is the first reading of the policy. This is the first reading. If you have any questions, we'd be more than happy to try to answer. The policy we have before us has been put together by the high school administration, and it is really um, requires that a student from out of town to continue enrollment in our high school um, meet certain behavioral criteria and academic criteria with regards to some of the things we were talking about before, such as class cutting and detention, attitude, effort, and so forth. Priscilla, you look like you have a... Well, I am slightly confused. We have two pieces of paper in our packet. We have policy title, policy title, policy title, and school board meeting. Can I explain that, Madam oh, Chair? Yeah. I just wanted to, because we're going to be talking about the policy for these some of these youngsters and also the cost effectiveness, I thought you'd appreciate a, sort of a historical rundown on the decisions you've made that have become policy. And you'll note that one is 84, October 9, second is October 9, uh, tuition costs, you discussed that at that time, and uh, a moratorium on December in 86. So I just wanted to give you some historical feeling for, you've been dealing with this for a few years. And uh, in addition to that, I thought it'd be a good lead into the cost effectiveness. So is this that we have then before us on the second page? Is this? Yeah, this is not for action at all. This is just Fashion. the board of that doing in the past. I thought you'd appreciate seeing what you did over a period of two years. So then this will be a brand new policy. This is a brand new policy. That's what I'm asking. Is this going to be added to one of these, or is it a brand <coughs> new? Brand new policy for the high school only. Question on part two, probationary acceptance. I think that's very unclear. Um, first of all, I think it should say students can be rather than will be. If that's what you said. It says they can be accepted on a probationary status if they have a successful behavioral but unsuccessful academic record. Then it goes on to say that probationary status will continue until they become unsuccessful either in behavior or academics. <laughs> I think that's a little confusing. I don't think... Uh, you mean they've already demonstrated that they're unsuccessful? In <laughs> well, you've, you said they have to be successful in one thing, and uh, I thought you were saying you wouldn't consider them at all if they weren't successful in their behavior. But then you're saying they can be unsuccessful in one or the other. And I think up above, you're saying they have to be successful in their mm -hmm. behavior. That's very confusing. Yeah. I, I think, uh, I'm not sure, we probably took uh, the, the uh, memo that came from the high school and uh, sort of murdered it. Uh, <laughs> I think what we wanted to say here was that uh, if a person <laughs> had a successful behavioral record and was trying very, very hard and wasn't as successful academically as we'd like, and then, if they became a behavior problem or an academic problem. Well, they're already an academic uh, problem. Right, so we don't need that part. Right. Then I'd suggest that you allow us to sort of rewrite that uh, item, too, for the second reading. 
I don't think we're saying it that way. I, I think probably we garbled up your memo. So I think we could correct it for the second reading. I guess uh, I, I have a question about um, the, the reason we would choose after somebody has demonstrated that they are unsuccessfully academically, the reason we would choose to have the taxpayers of Cape Elizabeth, who after all have no obligation whatsoever to educate students from other towns, um, I would think that it would be clear that the teachers with whom these students are working would have to spend a fair amount, if not a lot of additional teaching time helping these students become successful. Um, I guess I would have to say, speaking as an advocate for the Cape Elizabeth students, access to teacher time and special tutoring and uh, fostering and nurturing of their academic experience, I really feel that it's not our obligation to do that. And while that may sound a little bit uh, cutthroat, I don't mean it to be. I think that in the towns from which these students come, there is an obligation to provide a successful academic experience too. It isn't that we're turning them out to no place. We're turning them out of this school because basically we have no obligation. And if somebody's demonstrated unsuccessful academic work, for a year prior, I don't understand why we feel that, okay, well, let's go at it again and let's have that kind of disruption in a class and that kind of additional work for our teachers for at least a quarter or if not a half a year. I'm not sure that I, I think that that's too lenient. I'm not sure that I think that that's beneficial. In fact, I don't think it's beneficial for the students in Cape Elizabeth and for me, that's going to be my primary yardstick. And I don't think it's going to benefit the students in Cape Elizabeth to have this rather lenient view on out-of-town students who are unsuccessful academically. I have to say I'm not sure that just because somebody's unsuccessful academically, they are a disruption in a class. To me, being a disruption in a class is a behavioral problem. Is that not the intent of this? So, mm -hmm. so I, I'm not, I don't see that as a big negative thing. E.g., you could have a, uh, a youngster that's been with you 12 years as a senior, his parents moved, and you retain him, and allow him to finish his year here. It could be in special ed, and to be highly academic would be impossible, but his behavior would be, you know, what we would expect of mm -hmm. a student. Well, a student who would be in special ed, I make the clear assumption, and I'm sure it's correct, that the student's program will ha have been very well individually planned so that we would not be giving a student hurdles to jump that the student cannot possibly climb over. So, I mean, to me, the expectations academically of our special ed students are, or should be, and I'm really sure are, very appropriate to the, the academic growth that we expect and that their parents and have, in fact, for every one of those 12 years, agreed to. So I don't think that that's a situation that would be really what we're talking about in this circumstance. At least I can't imagine that it would be. I'm not certain what kind of circumstance it would be. Would high school principal do this one?
had involved, which is about uh, poor school year. But it's not behavior. then clearly this is more unclear than we originally yeah. thought it was. Because, <laughs> and I suggest uh, that we, I think we it, rewrite item two. For you. Then we can always have a third reading. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. that, is that all I think, comments for this month? I think we can clarify this. I think you can clarify. I hope we can clarify this. Michael, what's the incidence of kids who are asked to stay or want to stay when their parents move? Is that five a year, three a year? Do you have any idea on frequency? Or? Well, well, we're happy. I would think it's extremely high in the senior year there, if you will know, in the next, the next mm -hmm. uh, of the nine in the senior year, I suspect uh, I've received a lot of letters in that class. Are we ready to move on to the next item? Then, then Darrell, let's, let's move on to this, this item since you're looking at it, which is um, the, a report on the cost of out of district students. Now, I, the D was able to uh, put this together for us, and as you can see, uh, because they distribute themselves in such small numbers across the grade level, it becomes uh, very advantageous from a financial point of view. Uh, I bring it to your attention because uh, if the superintendent saw enrollments on the K-8 uh, lower than anticipated, you know, in another year, uh, he might come to the board and, you know, and say, uh, maybe it could be open at the discretion at least of the superintendent. Uh, because as you can see, uh, that's a healthy sum of money and quite helpful to us, particularly when it isn't costing us anything. So I, I just think it's a report that clarifies the cost. However, at this point in time, I would suggest we keep the policy exactly the way it is. You, you had asked Harold last time about our existing policy, and this also. I couldn't remember what the policy was. Yeah, yeah, that should help you out. Uh, Fran, Dee, can I ask the next time or another time that we look at these the numbers relating to the out of district students? Can you break this down for us into? The cost that we, the amount of money that we receive per student, and then the amount of money that we spend per student, K through eight, and then nine through twelve. I think that as we get less and less from the state, of course, 
our cost per student Cape Elizabeth taxpayers' money will be obviously rising. And I think at some point that may be a different uh, set of circumstances uh, for the board these. to respond to. Maybe. I'll, I'll update these. Yeah, I, I think it would be an interesting piece of information for the taxpayers and certainly for the board as they deliberate time, time to time and whether this policy is still in our interest or not. I think the whole, the whole thinking behind out-of-town students and the cost is that sometimes if you have an additional student in the class, that class would be there already, the building would be heated already, and you can't take mm -hmm. the whole pie and divide it by 1,539 yeah. students or whatever and, and come up with a comparison. And I just want to caution you to keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. Of these 46 students, do you know how many are um, children of teachers in the system? Yes. I have that. Fourteen. I think the number is fourteen. Thank you. Are there other questions? I move we um, uh, accept the superintendent's nomination <coughs> the hires for the physical ed and the English teacher position.
election will be Monday. The new candidates, the new school board members will be seated that Tuesday night for them at the start of the meeting. Would it help, uh, Madam Chairman, if I read Section 3 of the uh, new charter? All right. Oh, yeah. sure. Organization and quorum. Members of the school board shall meet for organization on the second Monday in June following the regular municipal election, except in 1987, they shall meet for organization on the second Tuesday in December, and in 1988, shall meet for organization on July 1. At said meeting, the members elect shall be sworn to the faithful discharge of their duty by the town clerk or by an ordinary republic, and a record made thereof. The majority of the whole number of school boards shall be quorum. Before uh, we finish, I'd like to ask the superintendent whether we've got anything, any committee going or any work being done with the administration with respect to that goal that we discussed at the beginning of the year uh, to, to determine how we can raise the level of achievement of all students. It's something that we talked about, I mentioned right. earlier tonight in are we able to get started on that? Just started. We, uh, we have it as a goal. Uh, we uh, give, gave some thought to uh, the possibility of writing a proposal that would allow us, uh, you know, some funds and some resources to attack it. We discussed it with Executive uh, Administrative Council. I discussed it as late as today with one of the directors, and that's where we are. But. Uh, I'm going to admit that it's going to be a very difficult task. Uh, I, I think we're going to put some kind of handle on it. But you know, that's not going to be done overnight. And that's going to be very, very difficult. The, the, the difficulty uh, is what? I mean, really, when we, well, when we're essentially talking about applying some of the teaching of thinking skills that goes on with 5% of the kids to greater numbers of kids. In other words, uh, some of the kinds of teaching that we do with gifted and talented, which is mandated to be 5%, that we could uh, bring that to bear on the school population at large. Now, that's the easy part. I'll give you an example. Yeah. And uh, I think we disagree with the 5%. But I think that up there, that's for funding purposes more than anything else. If you happen to have more than 5% you know, very bright children, what are you going to do? Yeah. So, and, and I discussed that with the leadership in the custom. Oh. For example, you had, as part of a gifted program, once upon a time here, uh, great books. Now that's been brought down to a large number of youngsters. Now the curriculum model that the gifted uh, committee is going to present to us will allow for large numbers of youngsters to get a lot of very, very good things. Now that's the easy part. Now that I think we're going to be able to do. And we're going to do that in the gifted curriculum model. It's a curriculum model, rather, for as many youngsters as can do it. And. Uh, the more difficult part is getting at uh, how you motivate youngsters to uh, want to learn rather than beat the system, if I can put it right in the vernacular. Mm -hmm. And that's the hard part to get to. And we're having a great difficulty on how to grab that. Because uh, very bright youngsters here know it's an easier way to go if you get good grades and get in college because that's what they're here for. 93% are going to do that rather than, uh, you know, have 93% want to become intellectual, curious, and well-educated. Now, there's something in the way here, and I don't want to go into a long discussion, but I've discussed this with the high school principal for hours. The grading system is in the way. I'm not sure. That to do what we want to do, or what I think you're talking about, we'd have to remove the grading system. Oh, Jesus, don't do that. Well, <laughs> no, we, we, 
be shot in a week. Uh, I do the shooting. <laughs> so uh, to answer your question, we're certainly working on it, and you've given us a, uh, a real challenge. Uh, I mean, to figure out, uh, well, first of all, part of this also, I hope you, you professionals will give some thought uh, to this observation of the layperson. Uh, some of it is simply making school harder. Raising People tend to do what's needed. And uh, the harder it gets, generally, the harder everybody works, uh, including the non-workers. I mean, the non-workers do a little less of what they were doing before and a little more work. So it's, I hope that the, you professionals will examine that phenomenon, which I think is human nature, yeah. that Part of it. the more asked, the more given. And I, I, I would hope that we, I, I, I only get a I don't want to say this too loud, because I'm sure a lot of people will get very excited, but I've only got about a year and a half left on the school board. And uh, I don't want to, yeah, I don't want to be pressing in the last three months to, to, for you folks to do something. I can't do it, I'm not a professional. You are, and you can do it. You've all had a lot of training, and you're all very smart and able, and you can come up with something, and I'll tell you something. If you can attack this problem, and if you can begin to design something that's tangible, that will raise our level of expectations in this school system for all students, you'll get a, a lot more kudos, and a lot more medals, and a, and, a, and a lot more orders to wear across your chest than you'll ever get from a few special programs. You'll be doing something that's very hard, that isn't being done by most school systems in this country because they don't have to bother doing it. And I, when you came here, one of the reasons that I got real excited about it because is that you have the ability to put something like this together. And I hope, since it's one of your goals, that you'll, you'll give us something. Because I know you can. Well, we're going to try, but I want you to know that uh, I... There are some days I feel that the only person who might do it uh, came out of Galilee and went into Nazareth. Well, <laughs> I, I agree, but, but even the non-divine people around here can design something that makes it harder for the students, demands more of them. And Harold, you should be bullied by the uh, cutting policy because that was changing behavioral expectations and um, I think the results yeah. were pretty significant. No, I'm, I'm enthusiastic. I really, I, I've come to have great respect for the ability of education professionals, good ones like we have, to make change. Okay, well, we're down to the last item of our last meeting. And it's uh, Mr. Kelly Bell, Board of Trustees. to get going, but I just wanted to share with you um, something I worked on very hard last year has come to fruition this week, and that is the beginning of our uh, math residency program. Um, about a year ago, I came to you asking permission, for permission to write an innovative grant to bring a mathematician in residence to Cape to work primarily at the um, middle school level, first round, and then high school at Pond Cove, second round. She did arrive today. She met with all three um, building staffs and uh, rotating through the system and really got us very excited about uh, strategies of math that do incorporate problem solving and use of manipulatives right from K through 12 and she will be doing a series of uh, demonstration teaching segments in the middle school this week that I believe Stephen has allowed all staff members to sign up twice to see her work. She'll be doing a family math night Wednesday night for parents of fifth grade students um, and we're just very excited to finally have her here and to finally lay eyes on this lady who got us very excited over the phone. She's um, bringing with her the excitement and the ideas that we had hoped that she would. Um, people from Augusta came down to observe her today as well and, and uh, shared with us that they 
um, find this project one of the most exciting going on in the state right now and are encouraging us to think of second year funding. So the potential for really doing some nice um, math curriculum work is there for us. Great, I just you. wanted to let you know Thank she's you. here to this Barbara, week. If, could they call in for her schedule of demos so that they want, could get in to see a demonstration? Sure, sure. I have that and I'm sure Stephen has it. Charlotte okay. Hannah's coordinated and that Betty piece. has my schedule of her demo, so if you want to call in, We'll tell you when she's, where mm -hmm. she is, when. Just wanted to let you know.